And I know that we've spent a lot of time talking about all sorts of lofty theories. We've done this whole dance between very concrete, very abstract, and bouncing back and forth. And I find that that is a, a useful way to learn things. It gives us a view to the specific, uh, but a grasp of the general. But what I was hoping to do in our, our final session is give you a cohesive framework for how you can organize movement toward change. And we talked in week two about four necessary conditions of effective change making. One being a clear definition of the problem, two, an inventory of the solutions, three, a clear definition of the outcome we hope to achieve, and then four would be the formulation and implementation of a plan. And we can expand on that a little bit. Based on everything we've covered so far, we can come back full circle with a little different sense of perspective. So I'll share what I've come to call the ecology of change framework. Maybe it's come up a couple of times in emails or other courses, these sort of things. But I find it's a nice array of lenses with which we can examine ourselves. And I think the whole thing of it is, we'll say I put this as the, the frame for all of it on top, what, can, what all of this can be nested under. And it's this line from Alfred Lord Tennyson in the poem Oinon, where he says, self-reverence, self-knowledge, self-control, these three alone lead life to sovereign power. And it seems to be the case that that's what we want for ourselves, this sense of sovereignty, right? Not that we can lord it over anybody, but we want freedom from tyrannical imposition, freedom from compulsion, whether that's other people, whether that's societal norms, whether that's our own internal tyrant. We want this sense of sovereignty, which to me seems... Uh, a level of agency. It's the ability to respond rather than react. It's human dignity, the ability to choose. We might think, well, that sounds well and good. And shoot, if there are only three ingredients in that little recipe, I can handle simple recipes. How fun. So we might then think, like, well, okay, what's self-reverence? And I would consider this to be the... the reaching toward all that you could be if you could be all that you could be, which is a big jumbled mouthful. But we, we consider this thing potential. We don't know what the hell it is, but we treat it as a real thing. And self-reverence would be the, the act of orienting yourself toward what is yet unrealized within you. It seems very future-oriented. It, it's optimistic, fundamentally. And I think implicit within that is the sense that it is worth orienting yourself toward what is yet unrealized within you. So not just that it exists, but that there's some, some imminent value in pursuit of it. That, to me, is what self-reverence seems to, to imply. And there's self-knowledge as well, which I interpret as this understanding of our history, of our habits, of our frames of reference. It's, it's understanding our proclivity to shrink as well. It's the sense that we know how small we could be we know our, our little quirks, we know our idiosyncrasies in, in varying degrees. And that tempers something of our potential. It's like we have this big boundless, seemingly endless stuff that we could be, that we could make manifest, and yet it's tempered by this knowledge of self. So this seems to be this pull between what is future-oriented and past-oriented. I know what I have been through. And in some sense, that's all I know. I only ever know what I've experienced. And a fraction of that. 
So we have this dance between future thinking and past thinking. Or you might think that self-control is at this middle point. And people have a strange relationship with self-control. We can think of that as our own little tyrant, right? I can hammer myself into a particular shape. I can drive myself and lash myself into uh, a frenzy of motivation and discipline and willpower. And, and that's not, I think, what is intended in this line. I think it speaks more to the, the ability we have to choose moment to moment. So not self-control as a, a, a crushing or a, a, a fitting of some procrustean bed. It's, it's the, the ability to steer our own ship toward that future or in service of that future, that self-reverence. And seemingly this, according to that line, leads to sovereign power an awareness of what we could be, a present moment choice toward that informed by our past rather than inhabited by it or inhibited by it. And this, I don't think, is an insignificant distinction because we are certainly informed by the past in an informational sense, in a structural sense too, we are put into a form by all of the things we've experienced. But I'm a, a Latin dork, five years of it, so I love the etymological roots. But again, we don't have to be inhabited or inhibited by the past, which would be the idea that it doesn't have to live within us. It doesn't have to perpetuate itself. And it doesn't have to hinder us. That would be the inhabit and the inhibit. So it can shape us. We can learn from it. We can organize ourselves relative to it, but it doesn't need to perpetuate itself or be an obstacle for us. So Implicit with this is the idea that if there's something we want to change, we have a sense of what that would be. That there is, in fact, a discernible difference between the way we wish things were or the way we wish we were and the way that things are now or that we are now. There's some gap that begs for a, a bridge. And we can clarify that for ourselves quite a bit. It's easy to get caught on the idea of an ideal future, some frozen, fixed, rigid thing. And people will often get very hung up on that. They will not see the forest for the trees. And I think what we might be better served doing is getting a visceral sense of the aesthetic of the future we're looking for, the form of it more so than the substance of it. And what I mean by that is that we are fundamentally oriented in, in some ways by our emotional responses, which are embodied experiences. And we might think that this idea of yuck and yum that we've explored a little bit gives us a hell of a compass. If we are keenly tuned into what is yum for us and what is yuck for us, that gives us a gut level sense of what kind of future we wish to bring about. And maybe more importantly, it gives us a lot of ideas about the futures we don't want to bring about. Maybe there's only this little glimmer of yum. Because positive affect is a, a tricky thing. It, we only experience positive affect if we have a, a goal and are moving toward it. But negative affect, that's kind of the default. So there are a lot of yucks. And quite often we know what those are with more clarity and certainty than 
than we do the yums. So we can start with that yuck yum idea and think, well, okay, right now, what would be yum for me? And what's yuck? What, what do I want out of my life? What needs to go? What do I need to get rid of and carve away? And if I have a sense of it, what do I want to move toward? Now with that, and this next part I will admit is a bit of a, a vitalistic leap. We're going to pluck an idea out of mechanical engineering and give it a metaphorical slant. So Professor Adrian Bejan of Duke University developed a new fundamental law of physics called constructal law, which basically posits that in a flow system, if it's going to persist across time, a finite flow system, we'll say, it must develop more efficient means of flowing through a landscape of resistance. Oof. Now, what does that mean? It sort of means the river is going to flow on its own. And we know that. But there's a dot, dot, dot at the end, which is that these flow systems will do so in the absence of constraints. If we dam the flow of the river, the river does not flow the same way. And I think it's safe to say that we're flow systems too. I mean, we move mass across a landscape full of resistance. We transmit ideas and information. I mean, in some ways, the, the stuff that we transmit is more real than we are. We're going to disappear, but our genetic material, our ideas, these things might continue to spread through the landscape, which that's baffling. And yet here we are. In some ways, we're an idea of, of our ancestors, our species, and you know we could wax poetic about that. But in a practical sense, it means that we may be better served finding the constraints and removing those rather than focusing on any number of, quote, right actions. What's the best thing to do? I don't know. How would you even qualify best? But you may be better served by raising the floor rather than raising the ceiling. If we can either ensure that our low points aren't quite so low, or maintain a different more effective sense of composure in the midst of those low points. That will go so much farther for us than worrying about how high the high is. The rolling averages work in our favor in that case. Now we, we have a sense of the constraints too. Again, those are kind of yucky feeling things. It's like, I don't have enough cash. I hate my partner. I hate myself. I can't look in the mirror, all this stuff no one takes me seriously. Like we could think of any number of constraints that we're probably aware of in, in multiple different ways. And it's, I think, simultaneously heartening and again, imminently practical to know that we are really doing ourselves a service just by removing those constraints. If there's one key thing that you sense is damming the river flow, like get that out of the way and look out. Now we might talk about how we can do that with greater precision too. One way we can do that, if we think back to what we discussed in week two, quite often we perpetuate our own problems with our attempted solutions to the point where our attempted solutions become constraints of their own. So a way that we can check our assumptions, if we have a hunch, or let's, let's hedge our bets and assume that maybe we're a part of the problem. Like we can assume some of the locus of this problem rests with us. It's not always the case. Sometimes there are uh, cruelties of time. Sometimes there are societal pressures. Sometimes there's just a lot you have on the plates or whatever the case is. 
but let's assume that we have some responsibility in the situation. Because at least then we can do something. So that's where I think this metaphorical orientation practice becomes really effective for us because it keeps us from doing the stupid stuff. So we might sense, what's it like? This challenge you're up against, this constraint you're banging your head against, what's it like for you? Is it like pushing a huge boulder uphill? Is it like you've got a ball and chain you're dragging along? Is it like you're drowning in this quicksand quagmire? You figure out what it's like. And you look left, and you look right, and you look front, and you look back, and you figure out within this situation, the way that I perceive it is the stuff I'm doing day to day working out for me. And usually we get the joke. It's like, oh, no, it's not. That's terrible advice. What do you mean keep learning when I feel like I'm drowning? That's not useful. Okay, so start swimming. Get your feet on solid ground. Figure out what that would mean for you in concrete terms based on that metaphorical practice. And we can extend it a little bit further as well. And to do so, I, I defer to a line from F.M. Alexander, one of the early somatic educators. He said that people don't decide their futures. They decide their habits, and their habits decide their futures. And we, we get that. It's like, okay, I, I have this vision of what I want to bring to life. Maybe not every nitty-gritty detail of the substance, but the form of it, the feel of it. I understand that. I removed some of these constraints. Now what? You can't just like sit there and twiddle your thumbs and mm -hmm. we've got to do some things. Our, our habits day to day or what are... That's the stuff that's molding the unyet realized within us. It's shaping us somehow, the things we do every day. And I can't think of a way that he's wrong in saying that. So then we might wonder, well, what am I doing every single day? And this is where like, the little bird comes in handy. If you imagine there's a little bird on the windowsill who watches you every single day. What does that little bird see? And how's that working out for you? Probably not well. It's never as well as we think. But that step out of our subjective experience gives us a little sense of, well, okay, am I lying to myself? Can I cultivate some sense of honest awareness here? And that, of course, brings us back to that tricky element of choice. If the little bird reveals something, a tendency, a pattern, a behavior that isn't cultivating the future you want, what do you do then? So we might then take it another layer further. We could get a little more granular with this. And each of these steps, I think, gets us a little more granular, a little more practical. So we might think, what's a habit? And a habit is essentially a, a behavior that we engage in across time to the point where it has some level of automatic quality to it. it it's subsumed beneath conscious awareness. It's a thing we engage in without having to think about it. So in some way, Alexander was right about that, but we can't always just choose habits. We can choose behaviors again and again and again and again. And there are two schools of thought when it comes to shifting behavior. And we'll address each of them because I find that having these multiple lenses, well, we'll, we'll talk about information theory. <laughs> later on. But for the time being, we might say there is a school of thought that behavior is primarily internally derived. And there's a school of thought that behavior is externally derived. 
and they're both kind of right. So we might say that on the external side, we could look at um, an idea from Kurt Lewin, who's one of the behavioral psychologists, a proponent of field theory. He says that behavior is a function of a person within an environment. That is to say that the, the people and the places that we surround ourselves with, those shape our behavior. Those constrain us in some way. And we sort of know that too. Like, well, you act a little differently with your kids than you would with a boss, than you would with your partner, than you would with whomever, than you would with me. We talk a little differently, we act a little differently. I certainly talk differently to you than I would to a cop after they've busted me for speeding or something like that. One, I'm trying to hedge and like, oh, please don't write me a ticket. I can't deal with that right now. So our environment clearly influences us somehow. I mean, we're nested in relationships. Life only occurs in relationship. There, there's a self and an other, and they are, they're fundamentally interwoven somehow. It would be the, the Buddhist idea of interdependent co-arising. One can't be without the other. So sure, our environment affects us somehow. So then we might consider, well, what do I do with that? Well, look around wherever, wherever you are and think, how is this influencing me? Is this the environment that evokes the utmost within me. And probably not. But again, can we make it a little bit better? This idea of stewardship is, can I make this situation just a bit better? I may never get to that ideal. Well, I never will, it's the ideal. But can I make this current situation I'm in a little bit better? There's sort of the, the zookeeper exercise I talk about with people. If you were tasked with creating the ideal environment for this critter called you, what would be the most enriching and nourishing environment? And you might think back to the idea of the, the yums and the yucks. There's certain things you would get rid of and not tolerate. And there are other things that you would add in. And every day we can, we can do just a tiny little bit and that may influence our behavior. And you might think it's not just the places and spaces, like the people too. If there's a certain group of people and you think to yourself, man, I always drink 12 beers when I'm with that group of people and it doesn't seem to be good for me in the long run, maybe you shift your social environment. And that's easier said than done, but if those people influence you to your detriment and you're aware of it and you willingly partake in that, future you's got some questions for you in that case. And it, it feels like judgment for good reason. That, not for me, I should say, I'm not judging anyone doing whatever, but our internal judge is no joke. So we might think, what are little things I can do to make my environment more evocative of the kind of behaviors I wish to engage in? And then we could shift our focus to the internal locus, that uh, attitude, we might say. And I think this is really well characterized by Moshe Feldenkrais, another somatic educator. And he says that we act in accordance with our self-image which is to say that out of all of the possible behaviors of the human animal, you will never do 90% of them. Like there, there's a small, small window of behaviors that you'll engage in that fit within your self-image. I always joke, like you probably didn't rob a bank last week. Not something, well, maybe you did, who knows? I don't wanna assume, but likely not something that meshes your self-image. Why is that? 
some people did rob a bank last week, but you didn't. So something about the way you conceive of yourself, it, it sets a bumper against that kind of behavior. It boxes you in somehow, it, not in a, a bad way necessarily. Like it's an incredibly stabilizing thing. If you could actually go out and do every possible behavior every day, like it, just randomly pluck from the whole repertoire of human behavior, your life would be in shambles. Like we're stabilized in a very important way by our self-image. It, it's sort of the, the checking mechanism within the stochastic process. It's the thing that keeps us um, self-referential across time. So uh, what the hell though is self-image? we might think that there are two components of it. One is, it's like, well, surely a part of it, an element of the self-image is the cortical representation of the body in space. Our mental models of us, where my knuckle is relative to my shoulder, that internal schema I have that allows me to clap my hands behind my back without seeing them. I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have an image of where I was in space. And if we ever need to check that assumption, you can sit on your foot until it falls asleep and then try to walk on it. It's like your image has been smudged somehow and your, your behavior is adjusted because of that. It's hard to walk on a foot when you don't know it's there. You can't feel it. So that's a part of the self-image, but it, I'm not just the emergent you know, phenomenon of my proprioceptive ability. There's something more to me, I think. And part of that seems to be the narrative that we embody throughout our lives. Each of us, we resonate with the idea of a life story. There's a certain narrative arc that we find ourselves on. And it's kind of like the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. That's another part of the self-image. Now all this to say, I don't know that we can reduce what a human is to cortical maps and some story. I think there's some ineffable other quality imminent within the human, we might say soul or spirit or whatever you want to call it. That's far beyond my scope to deal with. But surely a part of it at least is this foundational component of the cortical maps that is sort of the bedrock from which this other stuff called personality may emerge. And part of it seems to be this narrative component. So we can shift some of those cortical maps through movement and embodied experience, particularly movement with awareness. When we are directing conscious attention to our experience of a movement, the research is quite clear that that is a, a potent synaptic stimulus like we are laying down all sorts of new neurological pathways when we do that and not just laying down new ones we're myelinating them we're making them more effective more robust uh, more reliable and faster so we can shift part of our self-image through this movement and embodied experience And it seems to me that we can shift the narrative quality of our experience as well. When we take time to actively articulate what we have experienced, what we are thinking, what we are feeling, what came up for us in these lessons. There's a reason why quite often after a little movement practice, one of these audios, I might prompt you to say, take a few minutes to write about this. What did you notice? Where does this apply elsewhere in life? What we're doing is addressing three primary components of a good story. 
one of those is a sense of direction. It's hard to be engaged in a story that isn't going anywhere. And it's hard to live a story that isn't going anywhere. Like people who are directionless aren't having a good time. As we talked about before, there's, I mean, neuropsychological benefit to a direction as well. That's the, the primary source of positive affect is having a, a direction to move in and having the sense that we are making progress toward that. So the sense of direction is paramount to a story. And with that, there's a sense of bearability. It's not that we always want an easy journey, a, a perpetually pleasant story, because that's a little dull too, right? I mean, we don't want it always rosy, but we also don't want it to kill us or to become unbearable. And again, we might think, well, people who are living an unbearable story, they're not having a good time either. And then the third component of a good story is cohesion. It is a sense that these things fit together somehow. That there is an emergent gestalt within the experiences of my life. That there's meaning somehow in the relationships between all these things that I've been through. And again, every time we take a moment to reflect on our day or what that movement was like or what that argument we got in was, every time we reflect and try and chew up and digest these experiences, when we articulate them and put them into words, I mean, that's a marvel. We're the only animal that does that to this degree. And symbolic language is unheard of elsewhere. And if we can make active use of that capacity, then everything we encounter is, is grist for the mill. And I can't help but think there is some, something within our mental process that can't help but make meaning out of what we encounter in the world. Particularly like if we take a, a tricky thing, like a really challenging subject, the, Research is quite clear here, too. If there's a traumatic event we've been through, just writing about it frequently, like for a couple of days in a row, people get worse and then better. It's like it's painful to recount that. We relive a part of it. But when we write it out, because the, the research in these particular studies was by a, a guy, I believe, named Pennebaker basically took a bunch of people and had them write out traumatic experiences. What happened? What are you thinking about? How does that make you feel? All of this. And they wrote, they didn't talk about it. They didn't do any of those others, but they wrote about it. And after three days, they had a significant shift in terms of their relationship to that experience. Something about actually articulating it in words, they chewed it up and digested it a bit more. which speaks a bit to something we don't need to get into too much, but the difference between data and information. Our lives are full of data. Data everywhere, all of it. And it only becomes information when there's an ordering brought to it, some organization. So we can organize our experience and make something out of the noise. And this is, that's a profound thing. That we can do that just by writing, scribbling anything that comes to mind about a challenging situation we're in. It's like we, we engage in some dialogue with the, with the unconscious processes that are responsible for the organization of our experience. And that is a feat. 
It's like, you don't know what to do. No shit. Who are you? You don't know what to do, but something in you can figure that out. That is not insignificant by any stretch.